103. Blessed is the man who knows where the thieves will enter, so that he may get up, gather defenders for his domain, and put on his armor before they invade. Well, that's a corollary to Logan 21. We've already discussed it. Uh, the halakhic practice of defense from El Elim, from the, the evil spirits, and so on. The issue here not is when they will invade, but where. In other words, a disciple who's carried out its self-examination and vigilance has seen and understood his weaknesses. They are the where the invaders try to invade. So character flaws are this where they will come to invade. Uh, if thine hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into purgatory and the relentless fire, etc., etc. Yeshua said you really have to deal with this stuff. You can't just let it go. You have character flaws. Deal with it. Uh, Isaiah 66, 23, 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, and for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, etc., etc., that's the, that is the Greek, uh, that is the New Testament de uh, description of the east of the third heaven up in uh, purgatory where people are purified. That's where the Catholic idea of purgatory came from, by the way. Greek skolex is from the Hebrew Omeric, uh, Aramaic tola, which means a worm that self-generates from putrefying organic matter. And it says their worm will not die, and so on. Uh, it was also a kind of worm that produces a dye, a scarlet colored dye that could be used for royal garments. In Hebrew usage, the worm was the lowest and most unclean form of life, as in Psalm 21, but I am, I am but a worm and no man, the reproach of all men, etc. Uh, the idiomatic phrase, their worm dieth not, which we have uh, repeated uh, in, the, in the sayings attributed to Yeshua about so-called hell, but it's actually Gehenna. That means the scorn that heaven and earth have for their acts of wickedness will never change. So that's what that means. It doesn't mean they're, they turn into some kind of worm, worm that's being burned forever in the fire of hell. Or anything like that. Uh, so hands, feet, and eyes represent opening for forces of the Yetzer Hara. Hands <coughs> represent powers and actions yes. you might take. Feet represent places one chooses to go. Eyes represent the source of good and evil light, as we explained about the theory of sight and so on. So blessed is the man who knows where the thieves will enter, so that he may get up, gather defenders for his domain, and put on his armor before they invade. And I'm relating this to, to Yeshua's thing about uh, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better to go into life maimed than having two hands and go into purgatory and the relentless fire where, the, the, where their worm dieth not which means the scorn for what you've done will, will never change. So it tells us that the person who knows his weaknesses is blessed. This is a beatitude. Because he can be prepared when they provide openings for tests against his soul. Uh, if you become aware of your, of your character flaws and weaknesses and you're keeping a guard for it, then you can deal with it as it comes along. You might not get it the first time, might not get it the third time, but you get better and better at it. <clears throat> they said to Jesus, come let us pray today and let us fast. Jesus said, what is the sin that I have committed or wherein have I been overcome by evil? But when the bridegroom leaves the bride chamber, then let them fast and pray. Totally inauthentic. We have a whole section now of Gnostic redactions from Christian Gospels as well as Gnostic compositions with no basis in Christian or Yeshua sayings. They may have been originally composed in Coptic, not translated from Greek, even though some Greek loanwords appear as they do in all Coptic. Um, this one, uh, the first phrase supports the Gnostic idea that Jesus, unlike the disciples, was sinless and had no need for Prayer and fasting. Why do I have to pray and fast? What sin have I committed? I'm sinless. Docetic idea. Uh, we know that Yeshua resorted to prayer and fasting in his 40-day fast and in the Judean desert and many other times he withdrew and also as, as revealed in his advice to disciples about uh, this kind of demon can be exercised only by prayer and fasting. So Yeshua wouldn't have said, I don't need to pray and fast and all this kind of stuff. Um, in contrast, 
Yeshua was often challenged for laxity. He was actually considered to be uh, uh, kind of a wine bibber and a glutton, as they say. Uh, he responded to these accusations with rhetorical questions about new wine and old wineskins and unshrunk patches on gold garments and stuff like that. But here, he says, uh, he responds to this in a very different way. He says, why do I need to, prayer, to pray and fast? What sin have I committed? Where have I, wherein have I been overcome by evil? He says, but when the bridegroom leaves the bride chamber, then let them fast and pray. Ooh. Now we're getting to the bride chamber stuff again. In the Markan story, which is embellished in the versions redacted in Matthew and Luke, the Pharisees asked, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus says, Can the sons of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. And that, of course, is talking about the idea of after <coughs> Jesus is executed and so on. Now, that's obviously not an authentic statement. It may have been authentic because he was probably aware that he would be executed. It could have been. <coughs> but in many of the following logia, we will see uh, Gnostic concepts presented. And we'll begin with the Messianic Bride Chamber and Gnostic Bride Chamber. Thomas. Uh, the traditional Jewish bride chamber and traditional Jewish nuptial ceremonies, I've told you about it, the bridegroom comes in a procession with the sons of the bride chamber or the groomsmen at night to kidnap the bride and then the procession followed them to the bride chamber where the marriage would be consummated, etc. And then they would have revelry and a marriage feast would begin, sometimes lasting a full week. Nobody would fast. If fasting had happened, it would have been considered to be a deliberate insult to the families. No fasting happens here after the uh, bride chamber. Uh, the messianic bride chamber of Yeshua. In the original Devar, Yeshua compares himself to a bridegroom and his disciples to groomsmen. In rabbinical Haggadah, the theme of the marriage of Messiah was derived from scripture, scripture like Psalm 45, uh, which is a love song for the wedding of the king's son. In Pauline Christianity, the church was the bride, but in Yeshua's Devar, the disciples, who actually become a prototype for the church, are the groomsmen, not the bride. The, the church as bride of Christ was a later Christian idea. Well, so who was the bride of the Messiah in Jewish thought and in Yeshua's application of this? Well, according to Hosea 2, nineteen twenty, a scripture that was used in Messianic speculation, known to Yeshua, the bride of God was Israel. By the same token, the bride of the Messiah seems to have been a reformed and purified remnant of Israel for the Essenes of Qumran. In the great Isaiah scroll from Qumran, Isaiah 61, 4, 5, we read, You shall no more be termed abandoned, neither shall your land any more be termed desolate, because you should be called Hephzibah, my desire is in here, and your land Beulah, married, because Yahweh desires you, and your land, sh and your land shall be married. Because as a chosen youth marries a virgin, your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, your God will rejoice over you. So the bridegroom is Israel. And that's the, Messian that's the Messianic, that's the rabbinic uh, allegory out of which Paul derives his church as the bride of Christ. As, and, and as the body of Christ as well. Now, the Messianic brain, bread, bre, bride chamber of Yeshua in Kabbalistic mysticism, the highest union that a human being could aspire to achieve with Godhead was that of the Yahid. That was one's root sonship as an emanation of Godhead. And Yahida was the highest aspect of the human soul. The marriage of Yahid and Yahida was a union of Godhead and human soul. Yeshua was considered by his disciples to be one whose feminine soul had been made perfect, or shalem, by virtue of his, inter his interior union, and he's already accomplished this. Yeshua was there. He was, he was complete. They weren't. So, as the masculine Yahid, which is, by the way, uh, the Greek monogenes, which is translated as only begotten or specially beloved, and is applied to Yeshua, 
is a translation of Yahid. If you, you look it up in the, in the Septuagint, that's exactly the equivalent for Yahid. The Yahid of the Son of Man, Messiah, Yeshua would then be the masculine Yahid of the Son of Man, Messiah. And so therefore he was the bridegroom to the Yahida, or highest aspect of the soul of the new humanity. And so as the first born or first regenerated of the new humanity, he stood in the position of groom to the souls of the new humanity, and he was the initiator. And that's probably the way he was looked upon, not only by his disciples, but by himself. He didn't look upon himself as the one and only Messiah, but he did look upon himself as the initiator, the one who brought people into this, and the one who came from the throne. So the Mark and Pericope adds the following conclusion, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away, etc. Now, if, if this is historical rather than a, a later Christian extension, it implies that Yeshua was aware that he eventually would be executed, and you could make some pretty good arguments he probably did know that. So he might have said that. The Gnostic Bride Chamber. Uh, Logian 104 is completely ignorant of Jewish nuptial customs. In it, Jesus says, when the bridegroom leaves the bride chamber, then let them fast and pray. No, no, you feast. You don't fast and pray. It has no more basis in Jewish custom than Matthew's parable of the ten virgins, which is also wrong. It's inauthentic. <coughs> Then to what bride chamber does a Logan refer? Probably the Gnostic sacrament of the bride chamber. And so I've had comments on that earlier. Here, Logan 104 seems to indicate that after the Gnostic sacrament of the bride chamber was completed, the initiate was expected to pray and fast. And that was because his or her life as an ascetic renunciate began from this point on as a bride of the Father. And that was the meaning of the Gnostic sacrament of the bridal chamber. And as I said, it's comparable to a Christian nun as a bride of Christ. In the Gospel of Philip, however, the father unites with the bride, derived from the Jewish Kabbalistic Matronit, who is an aspect of Hachman and Shekinah, and she descended upon the crucified Jesus, and her light illuminated and led him to the bride cha bridal chamber, and his resurrection body was born in the bridal chamber, according to the Gospel of Philip. It's necessary that each disciple enter the chamber of the father, the writer of Philip says, Since it is allowed to me to reveal this mystery, I say, the Father of everything united in the bridal chamber with the bride who afterwards came down to crucify Jesus, and the light illuminated him then. And he, leaving that place, came to the great bride chamber. Therefore his body, which appeared in the next days, came out from the bridal chamber. This body was similar to a body born from a unity of husband and wife. That is similar to a normal human body. Jesus made in it, in his new body, everything similar to the image of a usual body. This is probably a docetic idea, that the resurrection was a, a body of a spirit type of thing, and the thing that the Johannites hated, and they put the, the Thomasians down for. So, <coughs> if, it's, if this logging is based on some version of the Gnostic understanding of the bride chamber, it would consider the father to be the groom, not Jesus, who is a child of the bridal chamber, and when the father leaves the bridal chamber at the conclusion of the sacrament, then the disciples would fast. So it's, it's kind of confused stuff, but it's definitely not anything that's authentic. One of five, he who knows the father and the mother, i.e. Jesus, will be called the son of a harlot. Well, guess what? He was. We don't know of any accusations that Jesus was the son of a whore from New Testament sources, but they were certainly made later in the first century by Jewish opponents of Christianity, and they've been preserved in the Talmudic literature, which is contemporary with second century Gnosticism. So uh, that's when Jesus would have been called the son of a whore. He was called the, the son of the Roman soldier, Pantherus, and so on, by Jewish opponents. But they had to put a, tam a damper on that Later on, when uh, the Byzantine Empire got so powerful, Christianity got so powerful, so a lot of the references, the anti-Christian references in Talmudic literature were written, written back in code. And you have to go back and understand the allegories, and to even know they're talking about Jesus, uh, they might say, uh, Ben Pandera, the son of the Roman soldier Panderas. Or they, are, they cloak it in a lot more language, because it was very dangerous then, for Jews to say anything anti-Christian, and if 
any of that literature got discovered and found, they were in deep doo-doo. So here's what they were saying. Jesus was a bastard born of adultery. Mary was a whore. Jesus was Balaam. He was an evil man. Jesus was a magician and a fool. Mary was an adulteress. This is all in Talmudic literature. Uh, the accusations against him were made after he was crucified, not before. And so this Logian must have originated after that time and could not have been a Devar of Yeshua. Uh, in this Gnostic saying, he is Jesus, who knows the Father and the Mother. These were attributions of Godhead that meant something quite different in Gnostic theodicy than the original Jewish Kabbalistic interpretation. And Yeshua was called Ben Pantera, the bastard son of a Roman soldier named Pantherus. His mother Miriam was called a hairdresser and a harlot. A great many of the allusions to Yeshua in the Mishnah and early Talmudic literature were edited to make them unrecognizable to the Christians who confiscated Jewish books or else they were simply removed to protect the Jewish community. We know about them from many sources and some of them still remain. They would be great to have because you can learn so much from them. But uh, among other things, the Talmudic literature tells us that Messianic Jews survived separate from Gentile Christianity for several centuries and that they were allied with Phariseeism. Uh, have you ever seen this graffiti before? This is the earliest depiction of Jesus. It's an ancient graffiti from approximately 30 years after Yeshua's crucifixion found scratched in the wall of a Roman barracks uh, near Nero's golden house in the Palatine Hill. It, the text says, Alexamenos worships God, <laughs> the crucified ass. So that was a... That was a, one of the first historical representation graphic we have of Jesus. Log in 106, when you make the 2-1, you will become the Baranash, and when you say mountain move away, it will move away. Uh, hmm. 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 Most of the commentary applies to this authentic Debar. If two were to make peace with each other, they will say the mountain move away from here and it will move away. Uh, in rabbinic literature, the metaphor of uprooting a mountain is used to emphasize determination. Uh, and I, I quoted you earlier, the Halakha <coughs> agrees with me, let the carob tree prove it, and it uproots itself and goes away and so on. Uh, when the disciples who are spiritually newly born achieve the goals of Yeshua's halakha and become shalem, in other words, mature, when they grow up and they're not teenagers anymore or whatever they are, uh, they will become one with the bar and nash. Another metaphor would be <coughs> brides of Messiah, since each yahida would be married to the yahid of the new Adam. That's what absorption into the body of the wise fisherman means. Once that's achieved, they'll participate as heirs in the sovereignty or Malkuth of God, and then they will rule with Godhead and rightly exercise divine power. And uh, the, uh, you will say mountain move and the mountain will move. That's, uh, that's a Semitic way of saying you will have power nobody has. It's used by Yeshua to illustrate the power of faith. Not faith, what we call faith, which is belief, but faithfulness, emuna, fidelity. One o seven. The sovereignty is like a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. One of them, the largest, went astray. He left the ninety-nine sheep and sought after the one till he found it. After all his trouble, he said to the one sheep, "I am more pleased with you than the ninety-nine." Anybody got any clues about that? That sound gnostic or authentic? And an elitist. You're the getting you're getting the elitist vibe. The largest of the sheep. He likes the biggest one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The original Michelle that we have from earlier sources reads, what do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? When he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than the ninety-nine that never went astray. Uh, this conveys the same information. Uh, we find it in, in Luke's version, who adds that, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth repenteth more than over 99 just persons, which is no repentance. Well, in both cases, the message is that Yeshua, as God's shepherd of Israel, seeks out the lost sheep of Israel. And it's an answer to the same question posed by the observant Pharisees who uh, questioned his attention to all these non-observant Amaharats 
He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. That's why I'm talking to all these people. But Logan 107 has been redacted to tease out a message that's quite the opposite. It's a Gnostic message. It specifies that the sheep who strays is the largest one. It's written to indicate that the shepherd loves the one biggest sheep more than all the others and will abandon the others and go to much trouble. The word is koptikise, which means a lot of trouble, to seek him out. And the shepherd doesn't rejoice because he's found a lost sheep, but he says to the sheep, I am more pleased with you than the 99. And so here we are with something that Gnostics would like. Just as the Pharisees believed that God preferred the small number of observant Jews to the many non-observant, the Gnostics believed that heaven loved their one out of a thousand and cared not for the non-monastic majority of society. So this was, this is, this is a, a real big, a well, a very highly spinned <laughs> Michelle. 108. Whoever drinks from my mouth <coughs> will become like me. I, sh I myself shall be born within him, and these, the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. Well, there is no Hebrew idiom for drink from my mouth, although there are many idioms relating eating to learning. Uh, this has a, a close relation to Logan 13, I am not your teacher because you have drunk deeply from the bubbling fountainhead which I have poured out. And you become divinely intoxicated, another Greek term. The idea of Christ coming to birth within a disciple as a development of Yeshua's original teachings on rebirth from above is a Gnostic interpretation of Pauline thought. Paul says, I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. This mystery, which is Christ in or among you, the hope of glory, we have the mind, the divine mind of Christ. So Yeshua's teaching was about spiritual regeneration in the Bar Nash or the new Adam. But Paul's metaphors were drawn from rabbinic mysticism, mystical union in death and divine marriage as the body of Christ, but he did not use Kabbalistic metaphors of lover and beloved based on the Song of Songs. Uh, Gnostic interpretation went beyond putting on the perfect man to the mystical union of the bridal chamber and drinking from the mouth of the risen Christ and finally merging with Christ. And uh, so this Christ that, the, that is worshipped by the Gnostics is actually a, a being that they've kind of created with their minds. He's kind of an egregor. He's like, you know, the vision of the Christ. He's not the real Jesus or anything. So this is, uh, this is a Gnostic statement. Whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. It's very attractive. I myself shall be born within him, and the things that are hidden will be real, revealed to him. And some Pauline language does indicate the idea, certainly indicates the idea of the birth of the uh, second Adam in, within a person and so on. But this uh, is taken a little farther than that. <clears throat> the sovereignty is like a man who had a hidden treasure in his field without knowing it. And after he died, he left it to his son. The son did not know about the treasure. He inherited the field and sold it. And the one who bought it went plowing and found the treasure, and he began to lend money at interest to whomever he wished. Did Jesus, did Jesus go for lending money at interest? I don't know. Uh, this is another Gnostic parable. It starts with an authentic mashal of Yeshua. It's the parable of the, the pearl that's found in, his, in the field. But it absolutely messes up the original message. Uh, Gnostic login 109 makes a different point. First, the treasure has been hidden generations ago. In Yeshua's Mashal, the guy finds this pearl in the field, and so he sells everything he has so he can buy the field so he can have the treasure. And that means that you value this among all things, and that becomes priority number one. But in this login, there's a different point. First, the treasure had been hidden generations ago, and the field was already in possession of the family. He doesn't have to sell anything to buy it. He doesn't have to give up anything. It doesn't have to be purchased. The treasure is already in their possession, but unknown to them. So this is a major Gnostic tenet. The, tenet, the, gnos the Gnosis is within you, but it has to be discovered. The heir sold it to another person. It was lost to the family. In other words, the Jews gave up their birthright to the Gentile Christians who went plowing, began to work the field, and discovered the, the secret, which is Gnosis. 
And now the Gnostic begins to lend money and interest to whomever he pleased. And that's a red flag. Yeshua hated usury. Uh, while we find making profit by trade used as a positive example in the parable of the talents, uh, God commends him for, for ma making profit through trade, he doesn't make it by charging money on interest. Charging interest on loans was used only in negative examples and other than <coughs> So this contradicts that. So to, to the Tamazian monks, to lend money at interest meant to profit spiritually from adding to their converts. The phrase, to whomever he wished, uh, refers to the right of the monastic community to accept or reject petitioners for admission. So this is not authentic. Whoever finds the world and becomes rich, let him renounce the world. This is a Gnostic corollary to Logian 80. He who has recognized the world for what it really is has found the body, but he who has found the body is superior to the world, which was a Gnostic interpretation of the authentic Devar of Logian 81. Let him who has grown spiritually wealthy be sovereign, <coughs> and let him who possesses worldly power renounce it. This is a real... This is, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether we do, have done this one or not. Renunciation of the world was an ascetic monastic practice, and it was not a practice of Yeshua. He didn't have his people renounce the world and all those sort of thing. One eleven. The heavens and the earth will be rolled up in your presence, and the one who lives from the, uh, the one who lives from the living one will not see death. And 11b, does not Jesus say, whoever finds himself of him the world is not worthy? So we don't find any words of Jesus describing the conventional Jewish apocalyptic image of heavens and earth being rolled up like a scroll. <coughs> the earliest we find this image used in Christianity is in the second century book of Revelations, after the sixth seal is opened. Coupled with the Gnostic phrase, one who lives from the living one and the lack of Aramaisms, it's just not authentic. Not see death is not authentic. Uh, it would not taste death could be authentic, but this is, uh, this is not the correct idiom. It was a Greek idiom originally referring to the kares, the terrifying, bloodthirsty death spirits that came to rot human flesh. And when you saw death, you saw it, and it was terrifying. And they were the kares. So 111 claims to be a devar of Yeshua, but it's not found among the authentic sayings, and the phrase, find himself, was not used by Yeshua. He spoke of losing one's soul, the find true divine self relates to the Jewish concept of the indwelling Yetzir Hato, but here it refers to the gnosis of the immortal soul. It's a Gnostic concept. And the phrase, of him the cosmos is not worthy, repeats a common Gnostic doctrine. Woe to the flesh because it depends upon the soul, but woe to the soul if it depends upon the flesh. <clears throat> this is literally uh, it says, woe to the flesh that depends upon the soul, and woe to the soul that depends upon the flesh. It doesn't make any sense that way, so you have to go back to the Aramaic, and then you can understand it. Woe to the flesh that depends upon the soul, and woe to the soul that depends upon the flesh. This is the authentic devar from which Lost Gnostic Logian 29 was created. It exhibits the kind of paradox that we find, and it contains Semitic parallel construction and so on. Uh, the Kabbalistic soul is all higher principles. The, f the soul clings to a dead man. The soul depends upon flesh, spiritually undeveloped man. And if you can, in fact, souls can, can try to keep themselves, the nephish can try to keep itself alive past its time and become an actually uh, a, a, a possessing entity in Kabbalistic thought. <coughs> but in a good man, the soul releases easily and, uh, in a spiritually developed man. And so the soul doesn't depend upon the body. It's the body that depends upon the soul. When the soul leaves, the body drops. His disciples said to him, When will the sovereignty appear on earth? And Yeshua answered, It will not appear by waiting for it. It will not be a matter of saying it is here or it is there. Rather, the sovereignty of the Father is spread out upon the earth, but mankind does not see it. This is a summary of the quintessential Kabbalistic manda about the advent of the Malkuth and the Messiah that Yeshua revealed. It's really the end of this dictation. 
probably the last thing that was dictated, and it's kind of a summary of all that. It began with Logia 2, Logian 2, not with Logian 1, and it ended with this thing. The Logian summarizes the path of the disciple. It ends here with the revelation that the Malkuth and the Alam Haba is eternally present. It's mankind who's blind to its realities. Yeshua said that the Basor would not be preached to all of Palestine before the Malkuth began to appear, and there were some standing before him who would not taste death, quote, until they see the Malkuth or until they see the Baranash coming in his Malkuth. In view of all this, the answer to when the Malkuth will appear must be it is spread out upon the earth, but men do not see it. If the question concerned when the Messiah would appear on earth, that was a Ratzin. Daniel said that the Son of Man Messiah approached the throne in the Anani, the mysteries, or obscurations, or clouds of heaven. The early Christians interpreted that to mean Christ would descend to earth from the sky riding on the physical clouds. But in this historical teaching of Yeshua does not suggest the mode by which the Bar Anash will appear on earth. More important, the messianic eschatology of Yeshua's tradition, the appearance of the Bar Anash could not occur until after the day of the Lord. And the Bar Anash was not a Davidic warrior, but a Solomonic sovereign. The last, uh, the last, um, the last Logian is not authentic. It's the one about uh, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of the life. And Jesus said, "I will guide her and make her male, so that she will become a, a have a, become a, a, like you, living spirits, you males." And I've said enough about this before. It's replete with Gnostic terminology and the Pythagorean dichotomy of male, female, female mortality, and all this kind of stuff. I came to destroy the works of woman. Uh, the Coptic words for male and female are the same as for man and woman, so you could translate it either way. The only <coughs> credible legend, by the way, about, uh, about Mary of Magdalene's life is the one that's preserved in the Eastern Orthodox Church, which is that she journeyed with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and John to Ephesus in Asia Minor and, est Asia Minor, and established the churches there where she would have been a mentor to the young John and the best friend of Mother Mary. Orthodox legends portray her as the most virtuous of women, not a prostitute, as in later Roman Catholicism. She and Mother Mary died in Ephesus of old age, leaving John as apostolic head of the churches in Asia Minor. Her relics were later brought to Constantinople. Several scholars have speculated that she was the beloved disciple of John's gospel. Gender changed to preserve secrecy. One of is a, is a Catholic scholar, Brown. The fiction that Jesus and Mary were spouses or lovers, which appeared and was promulgated in the mid-20th century, assumes that Jesus went for older women about the age of his mother. So this is the last saying added to the Gospel of Thomas. We don't have any oxyrhynchus or other fragments or quotations like it from the original version. Like many of the final logia, it may have been composed in Coptic. We saw a run of Coptic Gnostic stuff not translated from earlier Greek, and it may reflect an issue in the Egyptian Thomas community about the mission and status of female monks. The resolution was that they must become like the widows and virgins of the Gentile churches, in other words, totally celibate and ascetic. Sexual asceticism was the authentic sign. It was, in fact, the gold standard of sainthood in Roman Hellenistic Syria, and probably also later in Egyptian Thomasian monasticism. So now you've had a quick peekaboo at all this stuff. There's way more stuff than this in the book. No, and no it seems like uh, <coughs> I went to, uh, to pee and I came back, you covered about 20 of these. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry about that, John. <laughs>